So good morning, everyone. Let's start towards the end of the last session. We talked about digital signatures. And this was the last thing that we covered. And the idea here was that Alice wants to send a message to Bob. And this time, the problem is not really the privacy, but the authenticity of the message. So we have a different kind of adversary here. We have Charlie. We don't care if Charlie sees the message. The message is not private, let's say. But Charlie might change the message. And so when Bob receives it, he has to have a way of verifying that it actually came from Alice and that uh, it was not changed or tampered with by Charlie. Okay. Now, we talked about this a little bit before. So how do we verify that this message M actually came from Alice? We said that we want to have Alice's signature on M. So I want to have a sign function uh, that basically takes a message M and gives Alice a signature on M. And then we said that we also want to have a verification function, which basically takes a message and a signature and returns one if it's a valid signature. In other words, I want this. I want to say that for every M and S, verification of MS is going to be successful if and only if S was the signature on M. Okay. So uh, we also said that sometimes in the verification, instead of saying that I have a message and a signature and I want to verify it, I just say I have a signature and I want to know the message. Uh, so in this case, the verification function would basically be like the inverse of the sign function. Now, the main requirement that we have here is that only Alice can sign, but everyone can verify, right? Now, going back to our asymmetric cryptography, I don't like this kind of setting. I don't like to have functions that are secret, right? So I'm saying only Alice can sign. So right now, what I'm saying is that only Alice knows this signature function. But we said we don't want to hide our algorithms. Instead, we prefer to have keys and we prefer to only hide the keys. So let's say that Alice has a secret key and she can use that secret key to do signing. And remember before we called the secret key D, so I'm going to just use D here as well. So in order to sign, you need to know the secret key D. Now, in order to verify, it's a different situation, right? I want everyone to be able to verify. So you just need the public key. And we, we said that we showed the public key by E. So I can just say that this verification depends on the public key. And then just as before, I would say that the algorithms themselves are public. Everyone knows the algorithm. Everyone knows what this function does. The secret is really this D, the key is secret. And here, I mean, there is no secret. Everyone knows uh, the public key. Now, I want you to just think about this a little bit and see the connections between uh, our encryption decryption and our signature scheme. So here's what we have. Let's say I had a crypto system in which I could do encryption and decryption. And now I have digital signatures in which I have signing and verification, right? So in each of these cases, there was something that only one person could do. So what is the thing that only Alice can do? In the crypto system, this was decryption. Right, so only Alice could decrypt a message. In digital signatures, it was signing. So only Alice can sign. And then there was another action that everyone could do. And in our crypto system, this was encryption. So anyone could encrypt a message and send it to Alice, right? But in our digital signatures, this is verification. Anyone should be able to verify Alice's signature. 
Now, when I wanted something to be doable only by Alice, I said that it should depend on a secret key that only Alice knows. And I showed that secret key with D. And of course, decryption has to be done with D. And signing also has to be done with a similar secret key D. And when something was available to everyone, it was an action that anyone could take, I would say that you do it with your public key. So both encryption and verification are going to be done using E. So in some sense, you see that uh, there is a lot of uh, interface between decryption and signing and encryption and verification. They're pretty much the same thing in some sense, right? So I can use this idea and I can just take my algorithm for RSA, which I had here. Remember when I wanted to do encryption in RSA, I would just raise my message to the power of the uh, public key E. And when I wanted to do decryption, I would just raise my encrypted message to the power of the private key D, right? So now I'm going to do something similar here. I'm going to say for signing and verification, I'm going to use exactly the same functions. And this is what gives me RSA signatures. So this is RSA signatures. So here's the thing. If I want to sign a message M and I want to sign M using my private key D, I would just say that signing is the same as decryption. Okay. And it's basically going to be M to the power of D modulo M. Okay. So how this is how I'm defining signing. And of course, only Alice can sign because only Alice knows D. Now, when I want to verify a signature, when I want to verify some signature, let's say S, I'm verifying it using the public key E. So I say verification is the same as encryption. Okay, so I'm just going to use my encryption function and I'm just going to get S to the power of E. Now, why does this work? Well, what was the requirements that I needed? I needed only Alice to be able to sign and everyone to be able to verify. I have that, right? Because when I'm doing the signing, I rely on the private key D that only Alice knew, so only Alice can sign. And when I'm doing the verification, I only rely on the public key E, but E is public, it's in the name, so everyone knows E, everyone can do the verification. Now, in this case, at least in RSA, signatures are the same as decryption, basically, and verification is the same as encryption. Now, uh, let's say, let's check this one. So when I'm verifying something, or actually I'm, I'm doing this kind of verification, right? So it's giving me the message back, but I can also write it like this. It's just that you first calculate S to the power of E and then you check if it's equal to M or not. So I can write it in this way too. So I can say my verify function takes a message M and a signature S, and it's supposed to tell me whether S is a valid signature on M. And of course it depends on the public key E. And what it does is simply take S, raise it to the power of E, and then ask, is this equal to M? Modulo. And if it is equal, then you return one, otherwise you return zero. So you see that I can write my verify in either of these two ways. And I just realized that sometimes I don't put the Y in verify, sometimes I do, sorry for that. Okay. So the other thing that I wanted was that my verification should work only if the signature is valid. Now, this goes back to the whole point that we had before. So let's say that I sign something and then I want to verify the signature, okay? So let's say Alice signs a message M and gets the signature uh, S 
which is the signature on M using her public her private key D. And this is basically M to the power of D. Okay. And now let's say that Bob wants to verify. So Bob wants to verify the signature, wants to verify M and S. So Bob has both the message and the signature and wants to verify that this is a valid signature. So he calculates the signature to the power of E. So S to the power of E because he knows E, that's the verification. And S to the power of E is of course, M to the power of D times E. But the way that we chose D and E in the previous session ensures that this is going to be equal to M. And of course, all of these calculations are much longer. So if it's a valid signature, it will pass. But this is only one side of this uh, entailment, right? The other side is that I want to say, if it's not a valid signature, it should not pass, right? So I want to say, if S is not M to the power of D, then this should not pass. So let's see if we can say that. Suppose that S is not M to the power of D. Okay, what can I say? I can say, well, Bob calculates S to the power of E, so Bob is going to get something else to the power of E, which is not necessarily M to the power of D. But can I say that there is no possible way that this S to the power of E is equal to M? I don't know, right? Maybe Bob can somehow come up with a certain, sorry, maybe Charlie can somehow forge the, uh, signature. Maybe Charlie changed my message and also created a fake signature such that S to the power of E is equal to M. Okay. But what does that mean? If Charlie can do this, what does it actually mean? So here's the thing. I'm not saying this mathematically. I'm just going to say this. I'm going to put one side of it. I'm going to say that if it's a valid signature, it's going to return one. And I'm, instead of saying that if it's an invalid signature, I'm going to return zero, I'm just going to say, hey, it's hard to create an invalid signature. Now, why is that the case? So suppose that I am in this situation and Alice sent some message to Bob, but Charlie changed the message. Now, Charlie has to also create a signature on this message that passes Bob's checks, right? But signing, as we saw here, is the same as decryption, right? So we have the exact same security guarantees that we had in the case of the RSA crypto system. If Charlie can somehow fake signatures here, this means that he can use the same algorithm that he has for faking signatures to decrypt RSA. But we had this RSA assumption from before that said that you cannot do that, right? So in this case, basically creating a fake signature is equivalent to breaking RSA. It might be mathematically possible, but no one knows an algorithm for it. Right, so creating a fake signature or forging a signature is basically the same as being able to decrypt, right? But you can decrypt, of course, if you have the decryption key, but without that, if you don't have the decryption key, if you don't have the private key D, then creating a fake signature is equivalent to breaking RSA. And we talked about this in the previous session. Uh, no one knows an algorithm to do that uh, in a reasonable amount of time. So we assume that RSA is safe. So we assume that no one can create a fake signature. 
again, I'm not saying that mathematically the signatures are unique. The signatures that pass the verification are unique. I'm just saying no one can calculate them if they don't know. Them. Okay. So this is how I do signatures. And so now I have a really nice picture here, right? So I can just take this. Look, Alice can send a message to Bob. And when she sends a message, she also just signs the message, right? And we said that this signature is now an RSA signature. So it's just M to the power of D. So Alice sends these two things to Bob and then Bob can verify. And remember only Alice knows D, but everyone knows E. So E is public. Now, what happens if Alice sends two different messages to Bob? Remember, we talked about this before. We talked about uh, reusing our key in the context of encryption. And we saw that that wasn't a big deal, generally speaking. But now, what happens if I reuse my key here for signatures? So let's say Alice first sends some message M, and then she sends another message M prime. So she sends M prime, and of course her signature on M prime, which is M prime to the power of D. Now the problem here is that Charlie can actually change the messages, right? So Charlie sees what? He sees uh, everything that was public. So he sees M, M prime, M to the power of D, and M prime to the power of D. And uh, remember, Charlie can change the messages. So maybe Charlie can decide not to deliver these messages to Bob. And instead, he can just multiply the messages together, right? So Charlie sends this. Charlie sends the message M times M prime to Bob. And the signature that he sends to Bob is just MD times M prime D, right? He has all of these components, so he can compute them. And of course, this is a valid signature, right? So now Bob would think that Alice sent the message M times M prime. And this is, again, the homomorphic property of RSA that we saw in the previous session as well. So basically, Charlie can use the homomorphic property of RSA to change the messages. Now you might ask, why would Charlie want to do this? What's the point of sending the message M times M prime? That doesn't really matter for us because we are assuming that Charlie is malicious. Charlie is doing this uh, just to deceive Bob. And the whole point of having a signature scheme, having a digital signature scheme, was to make sure that this kind of thing cannot happen. But now it's happening. So how should we avoid this? How to fix this uh, attack based on homomorphic property? Give me some ideas in the chat. How would you fix this? So here's the problem. If I'm using the RSA signatures, there is really no way to fix this. Oh, what happened? Why did oh, the pages are in the correct order for some reason? OK. Look, if I'm using this, if I'm saying that the signature on the message M is going to be M to the power of D, there is no way to do uh, to avoid this kind of attack. Yes, in the chat, we have a good answer. And the answer is that the form of the message will be broken. So if I have some kind of a format on my message, for example, if I say that my message M has to be, uh, let's say, an English sentence, right? And then M prime is also an English sentence. If I multiply them together as numbers, I'm just going to get gibberish. I'm going to get something that doesn't make any sense. 
So Bob sees a, a garbled message that doesn't mean anything. And he also sees a signature on that garbled message. So the way we fix this attack is by requiring our messages to have a specific form, right? So require the messages to have a specific form. And make sure that if you multiply two messages, they no longer have that specific form. That's one way. But the easier way is to say that instead of signing on a message, sign its hash. Okay. And this is what we will always do in this course. So we say never sign the message itself, never sign M itself. Instead, always sign the hash of M. And again, I'm just using some cryptographic hash function. So let's say I'm using SHA-256. Why would this help? Because let's say that again, I have Alice and I have Bob and I have Charlie in between. Right? So this is Charlie. This is Alice, this is Bob. And remember, everyone knows E. So Bob knows E, Charlie knows E, and of course, Alice knows it. But only Alice knows the private key T, or the secret key T. Now, let's say that Alice wants to send the message M. OK, so instead of just signing on M, I say do this. Of course, send the message M itself. But first, take the hash of M and then sign that and send it to Bob, right? Bob can still verify the signature. It's just that he has to first make sure that he takes the hash of M and then verifies the signature on that, right? So instead of having the signature directly on M, I have it on its hash. Now, let's say that Alice wants to send another message, M prime. She does the same thing. She sends M prime. She also takes the hash of M prime and raises it to the power of T. Now, Charlie can try to take these uh, signatures and multiply them together. He would get a signature on H of M times H of M prime. But the hash functions uh, don't work that way. So that's not the hash of M times M prime. So it wouldn't be a valid signature on M times M prime. Right. So here we are uh, kind of combining the properties of the hash function. Uh, the fact that no one can uh, uh, basically find the pre-image for the hash function and no one can find the collision in the hash function. We're using that and we're combining it with the properties of the digital signature. And this makes sure that if I if Alice sends many digital signatures to Bob and if Charlie sees all of them, he still cannot fake a digital signature on something else because all the signatures are on hashes, okay? So this breaks the homomorphic property, basically. And remember this, so during this course, I'm always going to say we sign something and we just send the signature and so on. Whenever I say I'm signing something, I mean that I'm signing on its hash. So I will not repeat this all the time, but it's always assumed. And when you're writing your codes, when you're writing your smart contracts in this course, I also expect you to always take the hash before signing. Okay. Great, but now we've seen how to defend against two types of adversaries, right? So I know what happens if I have uh, Charlie who wants to change the message. And I know what happens if I have Eve who just wants to figure out what the message is. But what if I have both? So let's say that I have a message. Alice wants to send a message to Bob again. So again, I'm going to draw this. I have Alice here, Bob here. And now instead of just having one adversary here, I have a more powerful adversary who's the combination of Charlie and Eve. 
Okay, so this is Alice, this is Bob. So the idea here is that I have a message as Alice and I want to send this message to Bob. And this message is sensitive, it's private. I don't want anyone else to read it. But on the other hand, I want Bob to be able to verify that it really came from me, right? So we want to have both protections. We want to make sure no one else can read the message. And we want to make sure that when Bob reads the message, he can know that it really came from Alice. Okay, now how can we solve this one? Again, tell me in the chat. Any ideas? Look, so if I didn't care about the privacy, I could just do this, right? I could just use digital signatures. And if I did care about the privacy, I could just use RSA signature, RSA uh, encryption. So now I care about both. So I will just use both of them, right? That's pretty easy. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell Alice, hey, create your own uh, public key and private key pair. So I have a D of Alice and there is also an E of Alice. So E is the public key, D is the private key as before. And we tell Bob to do the same thing. So I will have D of Bob and E of Bob. And these are generated completely separately. So Alice uses the key generation algorithm to generate a, a pair of keys. And Bob uses the key generation algorithm also to generate a pair of keys. Now, if Alice wants to send the message M to Bob, she can, of course, as before, just send M and a signature on the hash of M, right? So this would be hash of M to the power of DA. But the problem is that M itself becomes public, but I didn't want that to happen. I wanted M to also be private. So I can take the exact same message that I was sending here, and I can just say, instead of sending it normally, encrypt it with Bob's uh, public key and send that. So I just sent the encryption using Bob's public key of this whole message, right? So now, what are Charlie and Eve seeing? Charlie and Eve are seeing an encrypted message. They can try to change it, but it would become invalid. They can try to decrypt it, but it wouldn't work unless they can break RSA. So only Bob can decrypt here. And when Bob decrypts, he will see M and he will see this signature on the hash of M. Now, after decryption, he just does what he did here. He just verifies the signature. So you see the steps are very easy. In step one, Alice and Bob each create their own keeper, each create their own public and private keys. In step two, Alice just uh, calculates the message that she wants to send to Bob. So Alice just signs M. Alice signs M to get, let's call it S, which is basically the hash of M to the power of D, right? And then Alice wants to send M and S to Bob. Alice wants to send both M and S to Bob, but she doesn't want uh, Charlie and Eve to see this. So she just encrypts them. So Alice encrypts the message. With Bob's public key. 
Because remember, in order to encrypt, I only needed the public key. Everyone could encrypt. So Alice can encrypt. And basically, the message that is finally sent is M prime, let's say, which is the encryption using Bob's public key of M and S, right? Now, no one else can decrypt it, but when Bob receives this M prime, Bob decrypts M prime. and gets ms, right? Now, finally, Bob has a message and a signature on it. So Bob verifies that S is Alice's signature on M. Now, here's the thing. The encryption makes sure that no one else can read the message. So Eve has no idea of what M and even the signature is. Like, not only they're not seeing the message, they're also not seeing the signature on the message. So that's the role of the encryption here. But then the signature makes sure that no one changed the message. So I'm sending this encrypted message, and maybe Charlie wants to change the encrypted message somehow. But if he does that, then the signature will not match. And then Bob would just reject the message, would know that the message is not from Alice. OK, so this ensures that we have both guarantees. It ensures that no one can read our messages, and we can authenticate our messages. We can make sure that the messages are really coming from the person who claims to be their own. Okay. Now, I have to tell you another point about reusing keys. It's really important not to use the same keys for both encryption and signature. So if I have a situation like this, remember Alice has uh, basically uh, a private key D and a public key E, and Bob has the same uh, private key and public key. Now, in this case, I was just saying that Alice wants to send one message to Bob. And I said, just do this. But what happens if Bob wants to also send a message to Alice? So let me just copy this. And again, I'm going to tell you not to reuse your keys, but in a slightly different manner. So do not use the same keys for signatures and encryption. signature and encryption. Now let's see what happens. Let's say that Alice has generated her key pair and Bob has generated his key pair and Alice wants to send the message M to Bob. So, so she sends it like this. Okay. And I'm actually going to kind of simplify this. I'm just going to say encryption using Bob's key of the message M and the signature of Alice on M. And of course, this signature is using the private key of Alice. Okay. Now let's say that Bob wants to send a message to Alice. So Bob also has a message M prime and he sends it in the same way and we are just reusing our keys, right? So he takes the message M prime, he signs on it, so this is the signature on M prime using the private key of Bob, okay? And then he encrypts it, okay? And he's going to, of course, encrypt it using the public key of Alice and sends it to Alice. Now, what's the problem here? The problem is that we have this powerful adversary who can see all the messages and can also change all the messages and can also decide not to deliver some of the messages. So here's what's going on here. The encryption was basically the same as 
verification, right? And the decryption was the same as signing. So what's going on here? Can I somehow use this? Can I take this encryption and use it uh, to do an attack? You're asking in the meeting chat, you can reuse the RSA protocol, right? Yes, I can reuse the RSA protocol and this is actually safe. So I'm just sending a bunch of encrypted messages. And of course, it seems like everything is safe here. But there is a problem. And the problem here is that you shouldn't trust anyone. So we not only don't trust Charlie and Eve, but Alice and Bob don't trust each other either. What's happening here? Bob is getting the signature of Alice on some message, on some message M, right? So what is Bob receiving? Bob receives the signature of Alice on M, right? And what was this signature? This was basically M to the power of the private key of Alice, of the secret key of Alice. But this is also the same thing as the decryption of M using Alice's key, right? So now we are in a situation where Bob can do something that he was not supposed to be able to do. He can decrypt some messages. So if someone else wants to send the same message M to Alice, let's say, let's say Carol wants to send M to Alice later on. Okay, so I'm doing this. Carol wants to send the message M to Alice. Okay, what is Carol going to do? Carol is just going to encrypt it and so, uh, sorry, uh, let's do something else. Uh, I'm going to call this one, I'm really sorry. I'm going to call this one M star, okay? So M to the power of DA is going to be M star. Now imagine that Carol wants to send M star to Alice. Okay, now what Carol is going to do is simply encrypt M star and send it to Alice. So uh, of course, Carol can also sign on M star. I don't really care about that part. I care about the encryption part here. So Carol encrypts M star, which is going to be the encryption using the uh, public key of Alice of M star. But what is this? This is just M star uh, to the power of the encryption key of Alice, but this is just M to the power of DA times EA, which is just M. So when, one, when Carol wants to send this particular message M star to Alice, what she's sending is actually M, right? But Bob has already received a signature on M and that signature on M was basically M star because signing is the same as decryption. So Bob knows how to decrypt M. So if somehow Bob is also the same as Charlie or Eve, then Bob can decrypt the message that Carol sent to Alice, right? And of course the situation is symmetrical. If Alice is one of Charlie and Eve, she can decrypt the message that Carol sends to Bob, in some cases at least, right? 
So this is one of the things that you have to realize in this course. When we're giving names to people, it doesn't mean that they're definitely different people. So it might be that Alice and Charlie are the same, right? So uh, I can have these kinds of attacks. So basically the problem is that I was using the same keys for signature and for encryption. So just look at it from Alice's point of view. Alice is using the same pair of keys to sign and also to decrypt. So when she signs something for Bob, she's also telling him what the decryption of that particular message is. And that's bad because Bob shouldn't be able to decrypt messages that were sent to Alice. Okay. So how can we solve this? Well, we can just say that each person has two pairs of keys. Each person has one pair of keys for signature and another pair of keys for encryption, okay? If I do that, then all of this problem will go away. So uh, again, I have the same picture as before. And here I have my Charlie and Eve. And here I have Alice. And here I have Bob. Now, previously, I said that Alice just generates one pair of keys. Okay. So she generates a, a key for decryption and a key for encryption. And these are, of course, RSA keys. But now I say, okay, use this only for encryption decryption, but generate another pair of keys. So I, I don't know what to call it. Let's call it uh, SA for signing and VA for verification, right? And these are going to be different. And maybe they're even using a different modulus in their RSA, right? And Bob is going to do the same thing. He's going to create a pair of keys for encryption and decryption. So. DB is the private key that Bob uses for decryption. Uh, and EB is the public key that everyone else can use for sending encrypted messages to Bob. And then he's going to also have a key for signing. And there is also going to be a key for verification. Other people can use. Now, just as before, when Alice wants to send a message to Bob, She's going to sign it and then she's going to encrypt it. But now the keys that are used are a bit different. So when Alice sends this message, let's say M to Bob, she's going to take M and she's going to sign the hash of M, okay? But for signing, she's going to use her uh, signing key, SA, okay? And then she's going to encrypt all of this. But for encryption, she's going to use Bob's encryption key. Now, of course, when Bob receives this whole message, he can decrypt it using his decryption key. And then he can verify the signature using Alice's verification key. Now, the other side is very similar. So if Bob wants to send another message, let's say N to Alice, he's going to first take N and he's going to sign on its hash. But of course he's going to sign using his signature key. And then he's going to encrypt this whole thing, but he's going to encrypt it using Alice's encryption key, right? So using different keys, makes sure that I will not have a problem like this. I will not have an attack like this. So in this case, Bob is receiving Alice's signature on M or on hash of M, right? But receiving Alice's signature on M doesn't mean that Bob can decrypt any of the messages that are sent to Alice because the signatures are done using this particular uh, keeper but encryption and decryption are done using completely different keys, okay? So this simple trick makes sure that you cannot be attacked like this. Nice. 
So now that we have digital signatures and we know how to combine them and we know not to reuse our keys, let's talk about how we can actually create a cryptocurrency finally. So we're finishing the first module of this course, which was about cryptography. And we're going to the second module, which is about Bitcoin, basically creating the simplest possible cryptocurrency. Uh, but for now, we're not going to have Bitcoin yet. We're going to have something uh, less decentralized. So let's say that I want to have a centralized cryptocurrency. Okay. What does this mean? I mean that I'm going to have a central bank. And the central bank is the one who's going to create units of money. So my central bank can print money, basically. Okay. But I want people to be able to transact using this money. And I want them to be as anonymous as possible. So that's the first issue that I want to consider, identities. So normally, if you create a bank account, your bank account is connected to your real world identity. But in this system, what we're going to do is very simple. I'm going to say you can create as many accounts as you like. And I'm going to say that your identity is just your public key. Okay. So if I want to create an account, let's say if I'm using RSA, I can use any other type of uh, crypto system or digital signature as well. But let's say I'm using RSA for simplicity. If I'm using RSA, I can just create an RSA key pair. I can just create a private key and a public key. And then I keep my private key to myself and my identity would be my public key. So if you want to send money to me, you just need to know my public key and you can send the money to that public key, right? So the money is not actually connected to my real world identity, to my name. It's only connected to my public key. And let's say, you send me $1, so uh, let's say someone with a particular public key, and again, we don't have names anymore, so I can just say that someone with public key one sends $1 to someone with public key two, right? I mean, of course, in the future, we're going to call this like Alice and Bob, but remember that even when I'm using names, I just mean public keys. So Alice sends $1 to Bob and all we know in this system, all we know about the identities are the public keys. So I just know that this particular public key owns this $1 now. Now suppose that Bob wants to spend this $1. Bob is the only person who knows the secret key corresponding to this public key. So I can create a transaction where I say this public key, PK2, sends that $1 to someone else, to some other public key, PK3. But in order for this transaction to be valid, of course, I need uh, the consent of the person who owns this $1. And that person is whoever controls the secret key corresponding to public key 2. So in order to make sure that there was consent in order to make sure that the person who's sending this $1 was actually its owner, I would just require a signature, right? And this signature should be a signature that is created using the secret key corresponding to this public key. And because I know the public key, because the identities are basically public keys and because all pieces of money are connected to these public keys. And because all I need to verify a signature is the public key, I can always verify a signature. So I can have a situation where I can do transactions without actually disclosing the identities of the people. All I know about the people are their public keys. And I can be sure that no one can steal anyone else's uh, money unless of course they know their private key but we're assuming that no one else knows uh, someone else's private key so if bob does not leak his private key then no one else can sign these kinds of transactions so only bob will have access to his money right that's the idea but on the other hand 
we have this nice situation where my identity is not exactly my real world identity and I can have as many identities as I like, right? So since my identity is just my public key, and since we talked about the key generation algorithms in the previous session, uh, it was here, right? So key generation. I know how to generate RSA keys. Now, if I'm using some signature scheme other than RSA, I would also have a key generation algorithm. So I can generate as many identities as I like for myself. I can create as many public keys as I like, and then I can use all of them to make transactions. So this is what we're going to see in the next session. We're going to see how we can use this to create a cryptocurrency, but this cryptocurrency will be centralized in the sense that there is a central bank who issues all the money. And then in the next sessions, we will continue making it more and more decentralized until we get to Bitcoin. Okay, great. So see you next week.